There we go. Trying something new. Can everybody hear me? Um, we're going to take uh, good natured out uh, into nature this evening and see how that works. Um, got tech support puppy with me here. Um, yay. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks for the confirmation. Um, neighbor's dog is barking, but um, if I get my mic nice and close here, hopefully that will get drowned out. Um, it was such a lovely evening. Uh, I thought we'd give this a try. Um, and these are on loan. So if they work, I'm going to order a pair of my own. And if not, um, yeah, it was an experiment. It didn't work. Anyway, um, so glad to see you all this evening. We got all kinds of fun nature to uh, introduce or maybe re get reacquainted with. Uh, so let's start our session. Let's see here. Um, we'll start with this one and go. Enough of that. <laughs> um, last week's column, if you if you had a chance to read it, or even if you didn't, uh, it was on the topic of Joe Pieweed. Uh, this is a, uh, a plant, it was probably one of the first plants I learned when I started, started volunteering with the Forest Preserve District. And I, I tried to convey in the column how excited I was to find out that there was uh, pie in the woods. Uh, that was before I, I learned how this uh, name of this plant was spelled. But um, Joe Pie Weed, as it turned out, even though it's not associated with pies of any type, it is one of my uh, favorite uh, summer woodland wildflowers. This is a, a plant, it does particularly well in uh, open woodlands. Um, when these blooms are uh, able to get the sunshine that they need, they, they really excel the plant. Gosh, sometimes they're, they're over six feet. Some are close to seven feet tall. They're reaching up for that sunlight. And uh, with the, the sweet Joe pieweed, which is the one that we have around here in our, um, in our woodland areas, um, the bloom color can range anywhere from a, an almost white to a pink to a, a pale lavender to a really rich kind of a mauve color. Uh, and they're, they're just... Uh, they're, they're, they're happening right now. I, I hope you've had a chance to go out and see them. And if not, hopefully you'll get a chance in the near future. Now, um, there are a couple of different types of Joe Pie weed that grow in this area. Um, the sweet, as I mentioned, uh, prefers a, a drier setting. It grows in um, our drier woods, our mesic woods even. Uh, but in some of our uh, wetter natural, say out at Otter Creek Bend, uh, we have another Joe Pie called Spotted Joe Pie Weed. You'll see they've got the same uh, genus, which I have to struggle with because I learned this plant as Eupatorium, but it's now Eutrochium. Uh, uh, purpurium refers to the, the purple color of the blossoms in the sweet uh, Joe Pie. And then um, Maculatum refers to uh, the spotted nature of the, the deeper colored stem of the uh, the uh, spotted joe pie weed that likes uh, the wetter growing conditions. Now, uh, I had wanted, once I found out that uh, this plant was named after a person, uh, and I'd heard, you know, different variations on how this came to be. Um, I'd heard that he was, a, you know, a, a shaman, a, a medicine man, uh, somebody who was an herbalist, someone who prescribed this plant as a medicinal. Um, and I, I just was curious to see how, how close to the mark those stories were. And as luck would have it, in 2017, this topic was actually researched thoroughly by uh, Richard B. Pierce and James S. Pringle. Um, uh, Richard, uh, unfortunately, he passed away uh, the year after this article was published. But uh, they really did a deep dive into the history uh, of Joe Pye and where this name came from. I have to tell you, I'm really, 
uh, thankful that the uh, the Native American who was Joe Pye actually did go ahead and, and use his, his anglicized name because uh, look at what um, his given name was, Shaquikoit is my stab at pronouncing it. And I, um, th th that is the name of the gentleman who was the Mohican Sackham, uh, which became the man who became associated with this particular plant and lent his name to it. As I think I said in the article is probably one of our country's first celebrity endorsements. He was well known um, in the East. Uh, he lived outside of Stockbridge, uh, Massachusetts and people came to associate the plant growing in his yard with him. Since everybody knew who he was, they just applied his name uh, to it. Um, they um, didn't really say that, um, you know, he was prescribing it for medicinal use, but they called him Joe Pye and this plant became Joe Pye's weed. So if you'd like to see it, uh, show you the title again. Uh, it was published in the Great Lakes Botanist and um, the PDF is available for download. So if you're really interested in this, it is pretty comprehensive. I want to say it's between 15 and 20 pages long. I did fall asleep a couple of times uh, working my way through, but it, it is uh, really interesting the amount of research that was put into determining the background of this uh, wonderful woodland wildflower and how it got its name. So um, you probably all have heard this knock knock joke. Um, knock knock who's there, banana, banana who. Knock knock who's there, banana, banana who. Knock knock who's there, banana who. You know, orange, are orange you glad I didn't say banana? Well, this has been running through my brain this past week because of this moth. Um, this uh, came to my uh, deck light last week I was sitting out here, it was quite a warm evening, and there's been kind of a, a usual cast of characters that I've been seeing this summer. We've seen a lot of different caddisflies, some really tiny ones, some medium-sized, some fairly good-sized ones. Uh, I was quite surprised, though, when, when this uh, fella showed up, uh, I want to say it was last uh, Thursday evening, um, it didn't take too much digging and think, well, actually what I did, and, and you might want to do this too, if you have uh, some moths that you have questions about. Uh, over at Creek Bend Nature Center, over at Leroy Oaks, the intern they have this summer, Matthew, is really, really into moths and he welcomes the opportunity and the challenge to uh, identify what you have found. Um, Matt actually had done a uh, uh, learned from the experts program a uh, week before last on the uh, Saturn and moths. So he's, uh, he's actually going back to school in the fall to learn more about moths and more about birds, but um, he's a, a wonderful local resource. And when I showed him my picture, he just happened to have uh, this particular field guide, which is the Peterson guide to moths of Eastern North America. And he looked at the picture and goes, I was just reading about these guys. It's called, appropriately enough, an orange wing. So orange you glad I didn't say banana. Um, so this is, it's a small moth, as you can see in the, the photo here, uh, or the, the drawing here, my photo makes it look quite large, but it's actually um, not too terribly large. Uh, wingspan is uh, up to 21 millimeters, which is you know, basically about an inch or so in width. Uh, the males have a little bit darker shading on their uh, their four wings. Um, you can see as Peterson guides do, they point out the relevant information there with those arrows. Uh, the the kind of cool thing about this moth though is they are, uh, they're geometrids. Uh, the geometridae are the inchworms, you know, geometry, inchworms, measuring. Um, so this uh, lovely orange moth came from a rather plain looking um, green inchworm that uh, lives on uh, locust trees. Now, uh, in the Peterson guide, all it says, and you can kind of see it there, the, the, this picture was getting kind of close to the binding, the, the word says, but the host plant is the locust. It didn't specify whether it was the black locust or the honey locust, but um, checking on bug guide, uh, they referred me to a website, marylandmoths.com. 
a fellow named Larry who uh, says that it is honey locust. And guess what? Uh, my next door neighbors, Mike and Audrey, have growing in their yard. They have honey locust trees. So I suspect that at least in the case of the orange wing moth that came to the deck light here at Casa Otto, that it was indeed uh, the uh, locust tree next door that produced this lovely nighttime visitor. I, I saw it in the nighttime. Uh, it was probably 10, 11 o'clock when it came, uh, was drawn to my deck light. They are one of the moths that flies in the daytime too. So uh, keep your eye open for this and, and other geometrids that are flying right now. You can see uh, looking in the field guide here, they do have a, a kind of a characteristic um, shape and then they have some uh, fairly typical lines. The lines might be different uh, thicknesses. They might take a, you know, a little different course across the forewings, but that is a characteristic of the geometrics. They have some sort of a line crossing those forewings. So keep that in mind and keep your eyes open because these guys are flying right now. So um, I don't know how many of you are Warner Brothers cartoon uh, fans, but you know, there's the, the famous debate of whether it's duck season or whether it's wabbit season. But around here, as we've seen these last few weeks, it's uh, actually wizard or uh, lizard season. Got another one for you. So uh, if you hadn't tuned in uh, last week, we talked about uh, a kind of an unusual lizard, an Aki monitor uh, native to Australia. But lo and behold, one turned up in downtown St. Charles. It was a uh, uh, released pet that we were able to reunite with uh, its uh, friends of its owners and they're now taking care of that lizard. Uh, so one more lizard off the street. But um, as a, we talked about this probably about a year ago, uh, the lizards of Geneva. So last night, yesterday was uh, kind of like today, you know, the, the weather or the temperature wasn't uh, too unpleasantly warm. There was a nice breeze. The sun though was quite warm and the sun will warm up dark surfaces like bricks. Uh, this is a, a building near downtown Geneva and it's near another building which uh, was a uh, pet shop many, many years ago. Um, pet shops oftentimes will, um, especially independent pet shops. I don't know if the chains would approve of this practice, but a lot of old time independent pet stores would uh, record, uh, recruit some biological insect control in the form of insect eating lizards to help catch those crickets that escape, uh, those moths that come out of the bird seed. Um, the lizard of choice is the Mediterranean house gecko. So as a result of this particular area of Geneva once having had an old pet store, a pet store for many years, a long time ago. We're talking about back in probably the 1980s. Uh, there's now lizards that are still found in that um, uh, area. So I went over and I started poking around last night. This was about probably 10 o'clock or so. And uh, here's some uh, grasses, uh, ornamental grasses that are growing up close to the building. And if you look really closely, if you follow this blade of grass, it's right in the middle of the picture. And you look down, 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 you see there's something close to the soil. Um, it was actually a little bit easier for me to point out, uh, to, to notice last night because it, it moved. Um, I was able to snap a quick photo. There we go. There's our house gecko um, out patrolling around the, uh, the base of this particular building. Now, um, last night, even though the, the air temperature was cool, as I mentioned, the, the uh, dark surface of the uh, bricks retained the sun's warmth from the day, I went around the corner of this building and um, I saw more movement. Um, and I, this really helped me figure out how these things get around. Um, this is in the center of this photo, you'll see there's a expansion gap, gap in the bricks. And um, I just saw a very quick movement and I apologize for the quality of this photo, but looky who's hiding inside that expansion gap. Another, uh, probably not full grown uh, Mediterranean house gecko, but uh, so I, I found two lizards in the space of about 10 minutes or so. Uh, again, when we, we did cover this topic a little bit last year, um, 
and I, I may have mentioned that I uh, one evening had a, a conversation with the staff that cleans this particular building and I asked them about the lizards um, and they were well aware of them. I was a little bit afraid that they were gonna say, oh yeah, we trap them, we step on them, we poison them. But much to my delight, they said that, uh, in fact, yes, they, they were aware of the lizards and they were told to leave the lizards alone because the lizards are helping eat the insects. So uh, yay for that. There's some, some understanding amongst the building management uh, in Geneva, Illinois. But anyway, uh, check it out. If you'd like more information, maybe shoot me an email. Uh, I will probably be going on uh, another lizard hunt uh, before the weather gets cold. But they're still there. Um, they're still doing their job. And that made me happy. So um, last week I, I read, um, I, in fact, I think I gave it the award of email of the week. It was from a woman who had uh, come home from a late night shopping trip. Uh, she'd gone to the grocery store and uh, as she was unloading her car, she looked down at the end of her driveway and she saw what she thought was a bobcat. Now, I, I have not uh, followed up with the woman yet to to get more details um, if she's seen that animal again. Frankly, if she does say she's seen it again, I'm going to guess that maybe it's not a bobcat because bobcats are so very secretive and uh, elusive in their ways. Um, when she described her encounter, you, you, if you tuned in last week, you might recall, um, she said that it sort of stuck around you know, looked at her and then it moved away slowly. That sort of struck me as a non-bobcat behavior because they, they really don't want to be seen uh, and they they tend to, um, you know, want to run and hide. Now, maybe one o'clock in the morning, maybe the cat is more feeling more confident and less likely to, to run and hide. Uh, you know, in the daytime, they, they definitely don't want to show themselves very much. So, but, um, Regardless, I thought it might be good to just convey to everyone um, what to look for. Now, clearly this photo here, this is not uh, in Illinois setting. This, uh, these photos came from Arizona uh, through a friend of a friend who was lucky enough to have not one, but two bobcats. Oh boy, something's going overhead. I hope that doesn't. Um, uh, you know what? helicopter. I heard they were going to be uh, treating for mosquitoes. I hope it doesn't <laughs> keep passing over. Anyway, sorry about that. Um, so the um, this these pictures I'm going to share with you now are from a yard uh, in Arizona. Here's the two bobcats. You get a nice uh, view of their profile. If we look at this photo, you can see the tufts that are on top of the head and you get a little glimpse of the pattern that's on the back of the ear. So we've got the, the tufts here uh, at the end of the ears. We've got this pattern on the back of the ears. And then of course, we have the bobtail. You can just kind of see it here uh, wrapped against the um, back legs of this cat. Here's a nice uh, image of the tufts, the uh, ear tufts as it's jumping down from the wall. Well. Uh, if you are looking at a cat that you think may be a bobcat, look for um, a, a few things here. I'm going to point out these uh, longish legs. Um, bobcats aren't huge. And th that was another thing in the email last week. The, the woman said at first she thought she was looking at a deer. Uh, you know, if, if the animal she saw was as big as a deer and it was a cat, it was probably a cougar, not a bobcat. Bobcats are... Um, they, they weigh about 20 pounds or so. Um, my house cat, Jimmy, weighs 16 pounds, so it's not unheard of. Uh, I know some friends with Maine Coon cats that have, uh, their pets are 20 pounds and more, but generally speaking, the, the, the uh, bobcats are a little bit rangier. Um, they're, they've got longer legs and sleeker bodies than our house cats. Um, they have been cited in all counties in Illinois, but you can kind of see this is an uh, IDNR uh, hunting and where, where you can hunt or trap bobcats. The sort of the uh, northeastern quadrant of the state, 
uh, there's no hunting or trapping permitted. Not to say that there, there aren't bobcats here, but they're just not present in enough numbers that hunting or trapping is, is uh, recommended or uh, needed. Uh, the other uh, three quarters of the state though, um, they are plentiful enough that there is a season. Now, uh, interesting thing uh, has happened the last couple of years when the states uh, and uh, when the state uh, puts the bobcat permits out, um, there's been a number of people who are non-hunters who have been um, registering, for, registering for and taking those permits in an effort to uh, help protect bobcats. Uh, so they are taking the permit, but then they're not going out and hunting. So that helps uh, preserve and, and to grow the bobcat population. So then the bigger question is, do, do we have them around here? Well, I, I can't say for, for certain. I have myself have not seen one, um, but there's two different incidents that stick out in my mind as, as very credible observations of bobcats. One was uh, a few years ago over by Good Templar Park, uh, the way the woman described the bobcat, plus the fact that she'd come here from Arizona where she'd seen many bobcats. Um, you know, her description of the short tail and the markings on the ears, it sure sounded like there was a bobcat headed under the fence into a Good Templar Park. Uh, the other one was actually Delmar Woods. It was a very brief sighting by an early morning dog walker, but um, what she described, what she what she saw, and, and the behavior of the animal, plus the timing, it was very, very early in the morning, um, that lent a lot of credibility. Of course, you know, Pixar didn't happen. Um, that's kind of the way that the, neither of those were uh, really qualified to, to be reported anywhere, but um, it's, you know, kind of nice to think about. Um, I did take this photo uh, a few years back over at Leroy Oaks. Um, you can tell this is a, a cat track in the mud by the position of the toes in relation to the heel pad. Um, you can also look at the end of the toes. There's no claw mark, which was kind of strange. Um, sometimes even in soft mud, a uh, cat's retractable claws will show as they try to get traction in the squishy mud. But this, there was also some rocks here. This was along uh, Fearson Creek at Leroy Oaks, but this is my two and five eighths inch um, lip balm and this cat track uh, measured the heel is down here. This, this cat track was oh, uh, at or maybe a little over two inches, which is quite large. Most of our domestic cat tracks are uh, just a little over an inch. So um, again, bobcats are not huge, but they are, taller uh, and maybe a little bit heavier than our, our average house cat. So I, I like to think this was a bobcat track. Did I report it to anybody? No, but in, in my mind, I found a bobcat track. Uh, here's those things to look for. Here's the, uh, the pattern on the back of the ears. Some people refer to this as an eye pattern. Uh, we see this in a, a lot of different animals. We were just talking about it in, uh, on moth wings a couple of weeks ago, how um, something uh, coloration or pattern that looks like large eyes might be effective in deterring um, larger predators. So uh, look for the white markings on the black back of the bobcat ears. And also look at that tail that gives the cat its name, the bobtail on the bobcat. Uh, keep those two things in mind. The markings on the cat itself can be pretty variable. They also have a summer coat and a winter coat. Um, what we're going to see here is the summer coat. This is um, a trail cam photo, um, not from King County. This was out in Joe Davies County uh, uh, back, gosh, now three years ago in 2018. But this was uh, a cat that was patrolling um, the grounds of a home uh, uh, not too far from Galena. And the woman that sent me these photos was, was a little... Um, I think taken aback, she'd recently moved out there and she kept getting game on her game camera. She was finding uh, not just bobcats, but also coyotes were traversing her yard. In fact, I think there might even be some Joe Pie weed there growing in her woods. Look at that. But anyway, uh, this shows a great uh, view of a great shot of the white on the back of the ears and those uh, short tails of the bobcat. So 
keep those in mind. If you think you're seeing a bobcat, check for those things. And if you think you've seen one, by all means, please let me know. Great, thanks. So this was something I was actually researching uh, giant, uh, or not giant, but leopard slugs, uh, which are um, an introduced species. And um, they occasionally show up here in Kane County. Um, but then I got sidetracked, go figure. I had this photo in mind. This is another uh, scene from Delnor Woods, thanks to all the rain that we had. Um, actually what caught my eye was not the, the slug at first, it was this bright pink stuff, which looks like it might be a fungus, but as it turns out, it's a slime mold called wolf's milk. This is in its early phases. As it ages, it tends to get darker and browner. And if you poke on it, it gets kind of oozy. So that's what drew me to this log. But then there was this slug, uh, not, a, not a leopard slug. This is the dusky Aryan slug, um, or maybe it's Orion slug that uh, is open to your interpretation. Um, but the dusky Orion slug um, is, it's a, a slug, it's, um, we have a couple, and it, it's, it's not native either, it's from Europe, as is the uh, leopard slug, and our other gray slugs that we find. But if you've ever handled one of these dusky slugs, um, you'll know them as the really sticky slugs. Um, they uh, secrete or exude a slime when they're moving that is, um, it's, it's really sticky on your fingers, it's hard to wash off. Um, in fact, it kind of resists water. Well, um, through a, a series of, of uh, clicks and um, articles that I started reading uh, about the slug, I come to find out that the dusky Orion slug has actually uh, formed the, uh, or gave the inspiration for a new uh, type, an experimental type of uh, wound adhesive. Um, the because the uh, the slime is sticky, uh, yet and it, and it maintains its stickiness even when it's wet. Um, <clears throat> these scientists have uh, used that as the basis for a uh, now experimental um, formulation for uh, wound adhesive. As opposed to you know stitching a wound closed, there's more and more of these. Uh, wound adhesives that are being used um, that can just, you know, you stick the two sides of, of the cut skin together. Um, and thanks to the slug, um, we may have another one on the market very soon. So I thought that was kind of cool. Next time you see one of those slugs, if you dare, pick it up. Um, see, uh, it will not take you long at all, I guarantee, to find out just how sticky their slime is. So, this was a little whoopsie uh, from the other night. I was uh, at a family gathering and I was throwing a football with my little nephew, Caleb. And the yard we were playing in had some rather low growing branches and, and more than once we threw the football and it, it hit uh, the branches was of a horse chestnut tree. So Caleb, um, he went to pick up the football and he goes, oh look Aunt Pam, there's a cicada. So I got all excited and we came over and, and sure enough, there's a cicada and um, I have a feeling that we may have hit it, knocked it down when we were throwing the football. But um, I did put it back on uh, a branch and, and it did hold on. So I'm hoping that she's going to be okay. But I wanted to show you guys what we saw when we looked a little closer. So here she is in my hand. This is a female cicada. I'm unsure of the species. <clears throat> what we heard calling in the yard that night was um, the uh, lyric cicada. So I don't know if that's what this one is or not, though I, I didn't look so much at her back as I looked at her belly. Check this out. Um, this is her ovipositor. And I'm assuming this white material here is the eggs. So the this cicada, she inserts this um, sharp uh, ovipositor into the, the uh, tender, um, young twigs at the end of a branch. Uh, she was on a horse chestnut 
as uh, she was going about her business. But I just thought this was a, a cool up close view. You don't usually see the ovipods that are extended like that. It's usually folded up against the abdomen. But uh, I thought you know, this is a, a good chance to uh, take these photos, let you guys see what exactly um, she looks like, uh, th th those organs look like. So uh, keep that in mind and um, maybe you'll find a cicada of your own that you can uh, uh, observe this on right there. Okay, so um, the other thing we noticed is that that ho horse chestnut tree as well as many others around here are loaded with fruit this year. Um, I think we're in for a big, what we would call a, a big mast year. Um, the, uh, it's not just the horse chestnuts on the right there. Those are some young bur oaks. I, I took that the same day that I took the Joe Pieweed uh, photo so that uh, those bur oaks are probably, you know, three weeks further along in their development now, those acorns. But um, I think we're in for a big mast year. Uh, I noticed a lot of walnuts dropping as well. When we have a lot of, uh, of food like this, uh, it's going to benefit the things that eat those seeds. It's things like chipmunks and gray squirrels and fox squirrels. And perhaps most important, um, the paramiscus mice, uh, the white-footed mice and the deer mice. Um, when uh, there's an ab abundant food source uh, like those nuts, um, the following year we see an uptick in the population of the things that eat those nuts. And then after that, we see an increase in the things that eat the things that eat the nuts. So um, after that, we should start to see uh, maybe a little jump in the numbers of predators such as red-tailed hawks. But there's another side to this story that I, I just wanted to throw out there um, and that's these guys, uh, the uh, deer ticks, also known as the black-legged ticks. Um, they are uh, dependent on white-footed uh, or paramiscus mice. Those play an integral role in the development of black-legged or deer ticks. Um, the mice serve as a host for the immature ticks, and they're also a reservoir for the pathogens that those ticks uh, carry around. Um, this is a, a diagram that shows how um, the pathogen um, moves into and around, in and out of the mice. And you'll notice that right there in the middle are humans we are considered a dead end host for ticks and pathogens, but we are nonetheless, we are susceptible to the diseases that those ticks carry. So anyway, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer or anything, but you know, en enjoy the nuts while we see them now. Uh, but just be aware that there, there could be some, some um, kind of chain reaction things that occur down the road as those, all this uh, abundance of food is consumed uh, this fall and stored away for this winter. And just one of those food, uh, food chain stories that, um, you know, just shows us as so often uh, we come to learn everything really is connected. Um, so now this, this is a little bit, um, this is a little video that I took when I was up at uh, Fearson Creek Park the other day. I don't know how many of you um, go after, go out wading in creeks and, and look for crayfish. I was actually doing this in preparation for um, our rusty rodeo, which I promote in a few slides. Uh, this weekend, we're going to go out and see how many of these uh, rusty crayfish we can capture. But this is, uh, this is Fearson Creek. And I want you to keep your eye on the rock that I'm about to lift up um, and move. You're going to see some action here. Come on, where's my mouse? There we go. All right, keep your eye in the water. I'm going to lift the rock up. And what goes shooting away? Uh, but a crayfish. And in this case, as it so often is in Pearson Creek, it is a rusty crayfish. You can see it now moving there um, in the water. It's orienting itself around. Yep. And now it's taking off the other way. 
I got to tell you guys, it was really sobering. Every one of these rocks that I picked up had a rusty crayfish underneath it. Um, we're going to see how many we can get out of there on Saturday. Um, but it was, uh, it's a good lesson. In fact, let's, let's watch it one more time in case your um, crayfish catching skills are a little rusty or are, and yet you want to join us on Saturday. Look at how they propel themselves backwards. Uh, they tuck the tail in, uh, they shoot backwards. They usually try to get to another uh, area of refuge underneath a, another rock or maybe a, a mussel shell. Um, but they, it's a, a pretty predictable behavior. Well, um, lo and behold, uh, there's been some research done into uh, crayfish movements and um, how their brain affects those decisions. Now, this is a little bit older uh, research. This goes back over 10 years, but um, the scientists, some scientists at the University of Maryland started uh, offering some uh, juvenile crayfish options. They would present them with a threat and a reward in the form of a, a food scent. And they, they varied the strength of the threat, uh, how imminent harm was to the uh, crayfish. And that was, they did that by using shadows that were either um, large and slow moving or fast moving. Uh, and then they, the food scent were, they varied in their strengths. But uh, what they found was that uh, the crayfish will uh, kind of quickly sum up what the, the benefits or what the gains and what the losses are that they, they stand to um, uh, inherit by looking at uh, these, uh, when the, the threat or the food uh, becomes available. Um, if a shadow passed over very quickly, they weren't as likely to scoot away. Um, they were more likely to freeze um, because what the researchers inferred to that was that the, the quick moving threat meant that um, they wouldn't have as much incentive to retreat and um, they would also be moving themselves away from this tantalizing food that they were being presented with. Um, they also tended to not move when the food odor was very strong because they expected to, uh, you know, consume that delicious treat or reward. Uh, however, if a, uh, a large and, and slow moving predator stimulus, a large shadow that didn't move very much, um, that then put them into their flight mode and they would indeed scoot away. Now, something that I hope uh, we are able to find, in addition to the rusty crayfish, when we have our event on Saturday, is um, these guys here. This is the um, um, the queen snake, which uh, we have found several of in the general vicinity of where we'll be holding our rusty crayfish event. Um, these guys will actually go underneath the rocks where those crayfish are hanging out. They're searching not just for any old crayfish, but specifically those that have uh, recently molted. So um, we're hoping that we will find both the queen snakes and um, the rusty crayfish when we hold our rusty rodeo. Um, if you're not doing anything on Saturday, I'd just be uh, really thrilled to, to see you come out. In fact, we're still looking for a few volunteers. Friends of the Fox River is bringing quite a few, and, and we, quite honestly, we don't know how many people are going to be attending this event. It's the first time we've held this event at Pearson Creek Park. Um, we did the last two years the uh, cooperatively um, program it over at Glenwood Park Forest Preserve, which is down in uh, Batavia, working with um, the Forest Preserve District as well as our friends over at Red Oak Nature Center. So we thought we'd, we'd branch out this year. And in fact, Red Oak's dream is to have this be a watershed wide event where we've got um, rusty crayfish um, events going on at many of the tributaries. This, uh, this is an animal that's really found in, in just about all of our tributaries. Um, of the, and it's in the Fox River as well. Uh, we've talked about this before, how they were brought in as bait and they were um, released as so often happens with excess uh, 
fish bait, whether it's um, you know crayfish or minnows uh, or even night crawlers. But um, we've got a lot of these rusties in town, in our uh, creeks, and we're going to see what we can do to um, at least lower the population a little bit. The uh, crayfish that we remove uh, will be used as food. We we uh, have a plan in place to uh, neutralize them by uh, freezing them, and then they will be fed to uh, the captive turtles at both Hickory Knolls and at Red Oak. So um, anyway, if you're not doing anything this Saturday, it'd be, be great to have you come out. Um, the event runs from 11 until 1 p.m. So with that, um, I'm going to stop the screen share, and I'm going to turn it over. To you. Oh boy, boy, lost their light here. I did bring a light over here. Let me see if I can get it turned on. Um, yeah. But I don't know if anybody has anything that they would like to share with the group this evening. Oh, that's a creepy look. <laughs> there we go. So we got a couple of chats here. <laughs> Laura, <laughs> yes, the. Um, the mosquito sprayers are out in force tonight and um, sort of thinking maybe this wasn't the night, the best night to uh, experiment with an outdoor good natured setting. At least if I'd been at good natured world headquarters, I would at least have the porch roof going over uh, my head. But um, uh, does anybody have any, any questions, any comments, anything uh, for the good of the group? Um, other rusty rodeos being held in other parts of the country and their success rate. Good question, Diane. Um, you know, not to my knowledge, but well, I shouldn't say, I know that up in Michigan, Michigan and Wisconsin have both been really proactive with their uh, rusty crayfish control methods because a large part of their economy depends on tourism and rusty crayfish um, ruin the habitat in our uh, streams and in our lakes that um, the game fish uh, require. Um, I know in Michigan, they've held events where they've actually then um, boiled and eaten the crayfish. And in fact, I did get an inquiry early on um, when we started publicizing um, our Rusty event. Uh, a woman wanted to know if we would be feeding the volunteers um, the crayfish that we caught, or if she should pack a lunch for her and her uh, youth group that she was going to be bringing. So um, they are, um, there are other, uh, there are places that are trying to, to do some mass collecting like this. Is it, I guess a bigger question would be, is it uh, effective? I suspect it's making maybe a little dent, but not a, um, a real big one. Um, I think repeated events might start to make a difference. It's kind of like, you know, pulling garlic mustard. And of course, now there's also, there's now schools of thought saying, mm, just leave the garlic mustard and eventually, you know, things will balance out. But um, if nothing else, we'll be getting uh, some nice fresh foods for our uh, captive turtles. And, um, you know, maybe we'll, we'll make a little bit of a difference too. Meg, I guess you're getting um, the truck and the helicopter. Yeah, City of St. Charles, they did um, publicize, uh, they put out a press release today saying that they were, there had been some uh, uh, mosquitoes collected in Geneva that uh, were shown to be carrying West Nile. So that, oh, oh they go over again. <laughs> um, boy, won't you <laughs> be laughing at me if I come out next week and I've, you know, grown another head or something from these uh, helicopter applications. But um, I actually was talking with uh, Valerie, the uh, retired nature programs manager for the Forest Preserve District. And she and I have, have both lamented that we don't have uh, chemistry degrees to, to find out just exactly, or, you know, what these chemicals are that are being applied uh, or if they're, you know, bacteria and what their longer 
um, reaching effects are, if, um, uh, you know, uh, are they harming the night flying insects other than mosquitoes? Um, nope, here comes tech support puppy. Um, and Jerry asked a good question. I wonder if the spring is the reason that the crows are finally back. Have, have we helped to neutralize um, West Nile by uh, controlling the mosquito population? That's a good question. I, I had heard that the, um, uh, the crows that survived uh, was uh, the, kind of like what didn't kill them made them stronger <laughs> and that they are better able to overcome the disease now than they were when it first showed up. Again, that's just what I heard. I would have to do a little more uh, digging to find out if that's truly the case. But um, I know I've got a few mosquito bites more than when we started this evening. <laughs> um, but I, I just, you know, there's, there's so many other things besides mosquitoes that are out at night. And I know they do the applications at night because they say, well, you know, that's when the mosquitoes are out flying and things like bees are not out now and uh, most butterflies are not flying right now, but it's not like they can go inside of a house. And then, then we've got all of our, our nighttime pollinators, our moths, um, the orange wing moth that we talked about a little while ago. Um, again, I'm not, I'm not dissing the mosquito applications because I don't know that much about what they are applying, um, but it'd be uh, a good idea maybe to do a little more research. Maybe we'll do that. Maybe we'll do a follow-up next week. Um, Sarah. Oh, thank you for that reminder. And I, I wondered if there was, um, if the background noises were coming through on this mic, um, that uh, the cicadas, the crickets, the katydids, um, yes, we are not holding Good Natured Hour on Tuesday, August 17th because of the program uh, that is being led by Carl Strang. Uh, you can register for that through the Forest Preserve District at caneforest.com. But you know, Carl Strang, uh, he was a naturalist at the uh, DuPage Forest Preserve District for, gosh, several decades, but he really carved himself a nice niche as being the expert uh, when it comes to singing insects. So uh, Carl is going to introduce us or reacquaint us with um, some of our well, primarily nighttime singers. There's, there's cicadas that call in the daytime too, but uh, we're gonna be learning about our uh, katydids, um, of which we have many different times. It's not just the, the true the the katydids and things like that. Um, there's uh, lots, lots to be learned on uh, Tuesday, August 17th. So mark your calendars. Uh, sign up for that if you can. Um, let's see, other than Nelson Lake, are the native crayfish found anywhere else nearby? Yes. Um, so we've got, um, I believe it's seven species of native crayfish, Laura. Um, we've got, uh, there's the northern, the northern crayfish, which is also called the viral crayfish. Virilis is the uh, species name. That's the one that it's it's native, but it's also the one that is um, uh, it's creating hybrids. It's interbreeding with the rusties. Uh, but we, we've got the northern crayfish, the calico crayfish. Um, uh, White River is the species. Uh, in fact, Laura, it, we found some of those one time when we were dipping. Uh, it was with your camp over at Del Nor Woods. Um, the White River. Uh, the species name is acutus. They get quite large in their reddish, but they have a dark uh, bar on the tail, dark um, uh, bar or band that goes the length of the tail. And uh, those are the, the, the uh, primarily aquatic species we have in the area. And then we've got our, our burrowing crayfish too, the devil crayfish and the prairie crayfish, uh, the digger crayfish. Gosh, it seems like I'm missing one. But anyway, yeah, um, we can find those. It's just they're getting harder to find because of the rusties. Otter Creek Bend used to have, um, we would find not only the native crayfish, but we would also find glass shrimp there. But uh, then 
as the development, uh, greater and greater development occurred upstream uh, that really changed the character of Otter Creek and uh, the diversity has kind of taken a nosedive there. Uh, we, we do uh, find um, the terrestrial species of crayfish at Otter Creek Bend up on uh, Crane Road, but um, yeah, in the water, it's, it's mostly rusty there now. Something fun to look for though. It's kind of like looking for the, uh, uh, the needle in the haystack only it's the non-rusty crayfish amongst all the rusties. <laughs> um, anybody have anything else? If not, I, I would say if, if the background noise wasn't too distracting, I'd say we might try doing Good Natured from Out in Nature again next week. Um, I've, I've enjoyed it and um, uh, I might be able to move locations a little bit too, depending on where I can pick up a signal. So uh, with that, um, I, oh, hold on. Um, uh, Michelle wanted to know, do lower water levels uh, affect crayfish? Um, uh, you know, do they increase the numbers? I would say, Michelle, that that lower water. So the crayfish are going to have to, you know, and and actually, when when we get into severe drought, um, even our aquatic species will dig little burrows to a certain extent to try and keep. They need to keep their gills, which are underneath their uh, abdomens. They need to keep uh, or carapace. They need to keep those gills wet so they will burrow into the substrate. Um, I would say that that a drought or low water levels might actually result in more getting predated because crayfish um, predators like uh, birds, like raccoons, they would actually have an easier time of picking them off in the shallow water. So that's, that's just a guess, but um, I would, that's kind of where my brain is going that shallow water makes it harder for them to uh, avoid predators, uh, especially raccoons and, and some of our larger wading birds, they can flip those racks over and they don't, uh, whereas if we're in a, a normal water situation or a flood water situation, then it's uh, the water's deeper, it's harder to access where those crayfish are hiding. Um, well, good, I'm glad the, uh, <laughs> you knows my hair. Um, <laughs> I'm uh, so glad that this worked out tonight, guys. Uh, we will try it again. Um, I'm glad I found a little clip lamp too, so I wasn't just the creepy voice uh, talking to you in the dark. Um, we'll see what sort of information we can get for you about uh, mosquito abatement programs in uh, next week. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Pam. Thank you. Thanks, Pam. Thank you, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Thank you. Bye, Pam. Thank you.